Hello and welcome to another video. In this one, we're gonna be diving into the GitHub Actions of pre-commit. Now, this is a very specific solution to a very specific problem, but I felt there was some cool stuff here, so I was gonna walk through this anyway. Anyway, let's jump into it. Okay, so if you don't know, pre-commit is a GitHub's linter formatter framework that I wrote. Um, I need to make a video on that, but I'll do that some other day. Uh, but to set the stage, the test suite for pre-commit took a very, very long time as of recent. Uh, for instance, this is a PR from two weeks ago, and if we look at the uh, the checks that ran here, you'll notice that some of them took up almost almost 30 minutes. It was averaging somewhere around 25 to 35 minutes, which is <laughs> way too long for a CI to take. Uh, at that point, it was almost frustrating to make a pull request, and it meant that I would batch up big changes or do other stuff to avoid sitting around for a CI. Uh, so what I decided to do was do some special stuff to the GitHub Actions to make them a lot faster. The first thing that I noticed in the tests of pre-commit, and I did this by using PyTest's uh, durations flag. So if you do PyTest help and look at durations, uh, durations will show you the end slowest tests. And when I did this, I noticed that the slow tests were not the core parts of pre-commit, they were the specific programming languages that pre-commit supported. Uh, for instance, Rust and Conda were two of the slowest languages, uh, just due to the way that they work. Uh, so I had this idea, what if I only run the language tests when the languages change? That way I can separate them out of core and I don't have to run them all the time, even you know, unless they change. And so what I did is I did a very large refactor to somewhat isolate the tests, basically having a test file for each language. So if you look at tests, languages, and then for instance, I don't know, the Lua test, for example. This test file here will specifically test every part of Lua and make sure that the language itself works. You'll note that it also doesn't import that much from pre-commit itself. Well, I guess it imports this random util module, which is a little bit chunky, uh, but most of it is just from the Lua module. And so for instance, if we were to run that file with coverage, coverage erase, coverage run, pytest test languages, Lua, and then coverage report, include pre-commit languages, Lua. So we're running just the Lua test and then looking at the coverage for just the Lua file. Uh, we'll notice here, well, even Lua takes a little while to run as well. Uh, but what we should notice is that it 100% covers the Lua file. So basically what I did is I took all the languages, I made sure that their test 100% covers their actual file uh, and wrote, wrote tests, split them out essentially. Uh, given that, I now had the rest of the test suite, which wasn't the languages, that could test the core functionality of pre-commit separately. All right, so that was the first step, separate out the tests. Now that I've separated out the tests, let's set up some special GitHub Actions workflows to make sure that they run separately. So what I did for this is I made a special three-part pipeline. So if we look at GitHub workflows languages, it's kind of three steps here. It's actually a little bit easier to view if we look at one where it ran. Uh, this is not one where it ran. Here's one where it ran. Uh, so if we look at languages and we look at the summary here. So basically what happens here is there is a first step called vars here. Uh, what vars is going to do is it's going to figure out what languages need to run, basically analyzing the diff, seeing which files changed and which files are relevant to the languages. Then it's going to run all of the languages, so a bunch of languages in parallel. And then I still wanted to have branch protection and a required check, so I have a dependent check at the end, which depends on this step here. That way, uh, if we run two languages or if we run 40 language tests, it doesn't matter. I just have to base my uh, requirements on a single check at the end. And this is how I did that in code. So you'll see here, this is the first job, that vars job. Basically what it does is it installs the dependencies and then runs this special script here. What this script does is it diffs the pull request against the primary branch to figure out what, what files changed. Then it imports all of the languages in separate processes to see what files they depend on. Uh, so I can basically say like, okay, if I touch one file that gets imported by the Rust language, I still need to run the Rust test, even if I didn't touch the actual Rust file. 
Uh, and so that's basically what this does. It also has a special option for dash dash all. I always run all the languages on the primary branch just to make sure that nothing regressed outside of the patches. So we, we're still keeping the in insurance that things are still working. Okay, so that's the var step. It figures out all the things and it puts the different matrix entries into a JSON blob. Uh, this JSON blob then gets used later, uh, right here, this vars.outputs.languages. This is basically the lists of language and operating system that it targets, because you know, pre-commit has to test on both Windows and Linux, uh, and it could test others, but those are the two that I target right now. Uh, and then it'll run that specific test. Note here that GitHub Actions has a little, <laughs> a little wart. If you have an empty matrix, apparently that's an error. So if you skip it before it tries to parse an empty matrix, that seems to be successful. So a little bit annoying, but something I learned along the way. Uh, then beyond that, it has a bunch of specific language setups. So like if we're testing Dart, we need to install Dart. Uh, if we're testing Lua, we need to install Lua, blah, blah, blah. After that, it's really just install the dependencies, run the tests, and then check the coverage. Basically the command that I ran in the terminal, uh, but it's you know the specific test here. And it makes sure that the coverage on both the language file and its test are 100%. Finally, we have that collector that I described before at the end. Uh, it has a dependency on those sort of matrix of different language jobs, and it needs to always run, otherwise GitHub will <laughs> get, so GitHub sometimes reports a skip as satisfying a uh, required check, but sometimes not. Uh, this is a little bit of uh, sneaky code that we learned works really well at my job at Sentry. We use this same sort of pattern to have a whole bunch of worked out jobs and then a single required check at the end. That way we don't have to update branch protection every time we add or remove something. Uh, but basically what it does is it checks if there's any failures or cancellations. These are usually timeouts, uh, this, this canceled here. And if so, it'll run a little thing that exits one. Uh, that way we can have a failed step if any of them fail or if any of them are canceled. Uh, and so putting all of that together, we get kind of this pipeline here where we set up the things that need to run, we run the things that need to run, and then finally at the end, we collect any of the results and use this as our required check. Uh, one little improvement that can happen here, you'll notice that vars takes 15 seconds. This is because I do a full clone. You could do the diff via the API, which would cut it down to probably like, I don't know, 10 seconds or five seconds or something like that, but this is still pretty, pretty fast. And let me show you some of the results of this. So for instance, this was a patch that only touched the Rust file here. You can see I, I only needed to make a change to Rust, and so I didn't need to run all the other slow languages. And uh, you'll see here that it ran the Windows Rust tests and the Linux Rust tests. So I didn't need to run any other programming language. Um, and it completed in somewhere around nine or 10 minutes. The Rust tests alone take 10 minutes. So <laughs> they're kind of the slowest thing now. Uh, this was a patch which didn't touch any of the languages at all. So you can see here, uh, we ran vars, didn't have any languages, so it got skipped entirely. And then the collector still passes on a skipped status there. Um, sometimes if you touch a lot of things, for instance, this touched the repository.py file, which is used by any test that needs a, uh, that tests a local compatible language. So even though I didn't touch any of the language files here, I touched this repository.py and store.py uh, and the store test, the machinery that I wrote noticed that a whole bunch of languages actually depend on that, and so it ran those tests anyway. It could be a little bit smarter here because the actual code that's used by the tests isn't important, but this is way better than it was before and honestly good enough. <laughs> I could use something like coverages, what tests what, to specifically know like, okay, this function was changed and this function is used by the, the Rust test, so I need to, you know, <laughs> I need to only retest if that function change. I'm just using module level granularity, which is good enough for what I need. Uh, and then sometimes, uh, kind of the worst case here is if you touch a file that everything uses, for instance, uh, not the conda, what was the file that changed here? The util file. Everything uses this, and admittedly, I need to split this file up into the specific parts. Like some of it is subprocess stuff, some of it is um, you know, file permission stuff. Those should really have separate modules and then the system will be better because of that because it'll know 
oh, you didn't change the subprocess stuff. You only changed the uh, file permission stuff. And the file permission stuff is only used by a couple things. So, uh, but because this file got touched, it uh, ended up oops, it ended up running every single language. And so there were <laughs> 41 checks here. And the crazy thing is, even though it ran all 41 checks, this is still faster than it was before, just because I'm able to leverage parallel workers and not have to wait on everything. Although. <laughs> Rust being the slowest one, it should really start first. That way, you know, you kind of get the the big things first in a parallel system makes the parallel system faster. Uh, but I haven't done that little optimization yet. And again, it's, it's good enough, so probably not going to bother. Uh, but anyway, that's that's how this works. Uh, you can see that on the primary branch, it's still going to run every single language, so we still get those forty one checks there. Uh, oh, do we have an open pull request so I can show you how the required checks look as well? Yeah, here's one. Um, so you can see here that we've marked this collector as a required check, so independent of how many, you know, the script language, or I guess it's just the script language here, um, we don't have to worry about all the other different languages that can run. We can just have a single collector and mark that one as required. I'm probably actually going to make collectors for these as well, just because it's so much more convenient than, oh, we added or removed a Python version, and I guess I need to change the required checks now. It'd be, it'd be nice to be able to just say, use the use the talks collector, or use the language collector instead. But anyway, I hope you found this useful. Uh, if there are additional things you would like me to explain, leave a comment below or reach out to me on the various platforms. But thank you all for watching, and I will see you in the next one.